Thank you very much and merci beaucoup. Um, as uh, someone who normally does not necessarily address uh, a ton of military folk, I will try to sort of engage in, in the local customs by relying on PowerPoint heavily uh, to inform my talk. Um, so here to talk about the uh, liberal international order, and it's worth asking what exactly I am saying when I talk about that. Um, simply put, when I'm talking about the liberal international order, I am referring to what we would consider the global rules of the game, which is to say what are the sort of rules, norms, and procedures uh, that govern the ways that states interact, um, as well as the constellation of uh, actors that monitor, write, and enforce those rules. Um, and, you know, it's interesting to note that I think in the last two years I have heard the phrase liberal international order uttered far more than the entire rest of my lifetime, um, which suggests you don't learn to appreciate something until it starts to potentially uh, be under threat. Um, now, back in 2014, uh, I wrote some books, and by the way, I've, I've managed to secretly put most of my book titles in this talk, which I'm really happy about. Um, you know, I, I, I wrote two books, and, and you know, even after the most severe economic crisis in a century, uh, which was the 2008 financial crisis, I was in a relatively upbeat place. You know, I argued in the system work that, in fact, despite many excellent reasons to believe uh, that the international order would not respond to what had happened during the subprime mortgage crisis. Actually, on the whole, these sort of emergency responses worked surprisingly well. Um, you actually saw decent crisis management uh, outside of the Eurozone. By and large, the global economy recovered much more quickly than it did during the Great Depression, which is the closest thing you have to experience, uh, you have to compare it to. Um, and indeed, I was so optimistic that I even wrote a book about international relations and zombies in which I argued that the zombie canon was way too pessimistic about the way human beings would respond to a rise of the living dead, that it underestimates the degree to which human beings are adaptable and so on and so forth. So pretty optimistic. Five years later, I'm less optimistic. Five years later, I am writing things questioning whether or not today's trade wars will actually lead to a genuine, you know, World War III. Uh, and I argued in foreign affairs most recently that even in a post-Trump world, uh, the United States is in deep, deep trouble when it comes to the articulations of grand strategy. I'm going to explain uh, why that is a little bit later. Um, I should point out in defense, it's not just me who's taken a turn towards the pessimistic. Uh, if you take a look at folks like Francis Fukuyama, you know, 25 years ago, they are... 30 years ago now, they, you know, were making much more optimistic arguments than they've made in recent years. Uh, it's worth asking what happened. Um, and, you know, I can obviously point at some of the, the clearer things. Um, but to be fair, that's not all that's going on. And indeed, we, you know, we've heard a lot this morning about the sort of other challenges to the liberal international order uh, that we need to think about. You can talk about, in some ways, two forms of revisionists. They're the revisionists from without and the revisionists from within. So the revisionists from without, obviously, we're talking about Russia, we're talking about China, in some cases, violent non-state actors and what have you. Um, but we can also obviously talk about the revisionists from within, whether it's the referendum that we saw with respect to Brexit or Donald Trump's uh, 2016 campaign and his presidency, the rise of people like Viktor Orban uh, within what we would consider the well-defined confines of the West. Um, these are both uh, significant challenges. So basically what I'm going to you know, spell out for you is the following, that, that first of all, this suggests you know, significant threats, but actually, this is often married to a conversation about the erosion of U.S. power, that, that U.S. power is on the wane and, and powers like China are on the rise. I would argue that, that the claims about the, the erosion of U.S. structural power have been actually radically um, overestimated, that in fact U.S. structural power remains surprisingly resilient even into 2019. Um, and this is something that I think has been misunderstood for a decade and is worth uh, understanding. And at the same time, I'm also going to push back a little bit on some of the conversation we had this morning. I would argue that revisionism from rising powers has actually, you know, the threat that's posed from that has largely been exaggerated. This is not to say that it's not real. It's clearly real. It's clearly going on. Um, I simply don't think it's quite on the level uh, that, or, or magnitude that is often talked about uh, within Western circles. And that part of that is because, in fact, U.S. control over significant amounts of sort of structural pillars of power have managed to persist. Um, that indeed the biggest threat is not revisionism from without, it is in fact revisionism from within. 
Um, and by within, let me be very, very clear, I am talking primarily about the United States here. Again, because it is the United States that controls much of the, the sort of pillars of structural power that I'm going to be talking about. And the really depressing downer I am going to give in this talk is that this problem is not going to go away anytime soon. It is worth asking whether or not the election of Donald Trump in 2016 was a fluke, a blip, rather than a trend. My argument is it doesn't matter. That in fact the underlying trends that wound up authoring uh, Donald Trump's election uh, are not going to go away anytime soon, even as Trump exits the political stage. So when I, our colleagues, and I, our theorists think about power, and indeed I think when, when a lot of people in the room think about power, we tend to talk about it and we tend to operationalize it in the form of capabilities. You know, things we can count. You know, how much is a country's defense spending? How much is a country's GDP? Um, we measure it in terms of, of resources. And also, I, I tend to think that, you know, the sort of common sort of folk realism that an awful lot of, of strategists tend to think about when it turns to capabilities is that they assume that as a country, you know, acquires more capabilities or an actor acquires more capabilities, it triggers some kind of balance and dy dynamic. It triggers a security dilemma. If one actor acquires more power, it automatically triggers this, you know, phenomenon where other states might fear its rise and therefore balance against it. There are, however, other ways of thinking about power. You can also think about power as a, you know, as sort of a structure, in which case power is not necessarily based on capabilities, but it's based on networks. It's based on where you are within a sort of complex uh, system and whether or not you, by establishing certain codes and standards, wind up controlling key choke points or key nodes that allow you to observe what's going on elsewhere. There is a fantastic article um, that is coming out in the next issue of International Security by Henry Farrell and Abe Newman called Weaponized Interdependence, in which they talk about the ability of a single power to be able to use panopticon effects and choke point effects, to be able to observe what's going on in the global economy and potentially to exploit it. And in some ways, that's what I'm talking about when I talk about sort of structural pillars of power. And the difference here is that whereas in these kinds of sort of, net, uh, sort of structures that create network externalities, there's not necessarily a balancing dynamic. In fact, if anything, there's a bandwagoning dynamic. There's benefits from joining the same network that everyone else joins. And so as a result, if you were actually lucky enough to be the hegemon and create this kind of network, it's extremely difficult for it to be dislodged. It's worth talking about, you know, the, the, the challenge talk uh, we had, or one of the, the keynotes we had in the, the morning sort of compared the current moment to the late 1940s. Um, and, you know, that's certainly an, an apt historical analogy, but I would like to actually think to go back to the previous time that scholars were insistent that U.S. hegemony was on the decline, and that was the late 1980s. Um, and, in fact, international relations scholars had a roiling debate about the degree to which the U.S. was the victim of imperial overstretch and that, you know, Japan and West Germany were somehow going to eat our lunch and that really it was the end of the American era. Um, and the reason I talk about the strange state of the current order is that this is a play on words. That is a photo of Susan Strange, who was an international political economist, who wrote a brilliant article in 1987 called The Vanishing Myth of Lost Hegemony. Um, or the, 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 I think that's it. Um, in which he, what? The persistent, thank you, I knew that, that didn't make any sense. The persistent myth of lost hegemony. Um, in which he pointed out that essentially people were measuring hegemonic power incorrectly. And she talked about sort of four different structural pillars of power that were necessary to maintain sort of a global order. The first and most uh, uh, you know, obvious being security, but also control over sort of production networks and trade networks, control over credit and finance, and control over the sort of production of ideas and information. Um, that if you were an actor that actually managed to be at the center of all three, you know, all four of these networks, you essentially did exercise hegemonic power. And what Susan Strange argued in the late 1980s was that there was no evidence whatsoever that the U.S. was, you know, facing an erosion in any of these categories, and therefore its hegemony was likely to persist, which proved to be relatively prescient. Now, this raises an interesting question. If you want to revise a global order, if, you know, you're a revisionist power, you're rising, and you want to sort of challenge this existing uh, hegemonic structure, how do you do it? Because the fact is, is that if you take a look at the sort of history of the global political economy for the last two centuries, there is only one surefire way of doing this, and that is launching a great power war. And this is not, generally speaking, a recommended way of doing these kinds of things. Um, and indeed, it would be safe to say that the cost of doing so would not be worth it. So the traditional method is relatively expensive. Furthermore, if you are a rising power, you have to be relatively delicate about this. 
Because if you try to, let's say, you know, engage in sort of, a, you know, truly aggressive revisionism, there is a possibility that you will be closed out from the sort of existing fruits of the system or the existing structures prematurely. Presumably, you are not a rising power unless you actually benefit from the status quo. And so if you actually get shut out of that, you could wind up being weaker than you otherwise want to be. Um, and this is why, therefore, you have to be concerned about premature signaling. And there's also a concern, by the way, that you might not just be premature in actually challenging it. You might be premature in succeeding. Because if there are certain sort of structures, particularly in areas like currency or I think the global supply chain, in which there are winner-take-all dynamics, if, let's say, you were somehow to be able to uproot the status of the U.S. dollar as the global reserve currency, it actually collapses, it will not collapse slowly. It will collapse very, very quickly, in which case you suddenly create genuine financial chaos and furthermore would have to prematurely shoulder responsibilities that you don't necessarily want to do. So. The question is, is, is there an optimal way to actually revise a global order? Is there an optimal way to create a challenge or a substitute to an existing uh, global order? And I argue, and I've got this in an uh, article that just came out in security studies, that there is. There is a sort of rational form of revisionism. And if you do this in looking at the sort of different pillars that, that Susan Strange talked about, you'd first want to go at ideas and information. You would first want to delegitimate the ideas that animate the existing global order. In other words, you want people to be open to the possibility that maybe there are alternatives out there that might actually be better. And it is in some ways seen as the least threatening move. Then you would want to presumably challenge the production order. You would want to make sure that you became much more at the center of that um, than other actors um, because production generates somewhat fewer anxieties than either security or finance. And then you would only go after the security-led order and the financial order at the very end once you sort of lined up your other ducks. In other words, basically, you're sort of trying to slowly escalate to keep the hegemonic frog, as it were, from not noticing that the water that they're in is boiling very slowly, to the point when you are actually ready to take over. By that point, you can, you know, you're willing to shoulder the costs. So this leads us to ask, is China, and let's be blunt here, China is the only actor that could viably challenge the existing global order. Russia can certainly play the role of a spoiler. Other non-state actors can play the role of spoilers, but they can't create anything you know, in the way of an alternative. China is the one actor that can potentially do this. Um, are they capable of doing so? Are they actually acting in a revisionist way? And it is worth noting that it is undeniable over the last decade that China seems to be acting in a somewhat more revisionist way. You know, if you compare the China of 2008, in which by and large they tried to keep quiet, they didn't, you know, weren't taking advantage of the 2008 financial crisis to sort of loudly declare it's time for the Beijing consensus and so on and so forth. If you compare that to China in 2018, China in 2018 looks far more revisionist. Um, for the first time, you've occasionally seen, you know, official rhetoric from Xi Jinping claiming that the China model might be a model that others want to embrace. Um, you know, obviously, in terms of the, uh, the export of, of the surveillance state technology, that's a, a source of concern as well. Not to mention Xi Jinping now being elevated to ruler for life, whereas previously you could sort of talk about routine, you know, routinized author, uh, authoritarianism. And obviously, and we saw this discussed in the, in the morning, you've seen a whole raft of Chinese initiatives uh, ranging from the Shanghai Cooperation Organization to the AAIB, uh, to BRI, all representing presumably what are viewed as alternatives or substitutes to what we would think of as the sort of traditional Bretton Woods institutions, the traditional sort of Western-based uh, liberal international order, and these are obviously viewed as concerns. Um, and indeed, we also saw discussion about debt trap diplomacy, uh, the idea that potentially China, through its BRI, is somehow sort of, you know, offering the first loan for free and then many, many loans after that that generate, you know, addiction to BRI uh, loans, which then cause ownership of ports in Sri Lanka, uh, elsewhere, and so forth. So now is where I'm going to pivot and, and say something that I don't think you often say at security conferences. Um, people need to relax the hell out um, on this, which is to say that I think, by and large, there are generally three schools of thought when it comes to, to China and particularly with BRI. And I think, unfortunately, in a lot of official security circles, the first school of thought that is often heard of is the loudest and is what I like to call the hashtag OMG China approach, which is to say it's an interpretation that anything that China does must be viewed as a strategic masterstroke um, and that, therefore, there is this sort of effortless rise um, and that is epitomized by BRI. 
It is worth pointing out the ways in which China, while undeniably doing these kinds of things, is also can claim paradoxically to be a responsible stakeholder, the language that Bob Zellick uh, employed over 15 years ago. China is the P5 member that contributes the largest to UN peacekeeping. Uh, you know, Xi Jinping has walked back, actually, his previously bellicose language about exporting the China model to saying, now, no, we don't necessarily see this uh, applied elsewhere. And I think in some ways China's approach can be highlighted by the speech that he gave in Davos in 2017 where he defended the liberal international order. Now, let me be very clear. When Xi Jinping did this, he was displaying massive levels of hypocrisy. Uh, there is no denying that on a variety of ways China does not adhere to the liberal international order. But as an American, I have to be upset about this because, damn it, we're the hypocrites, all right? We're the ones who are normally really, really good about saying one thing and doing something else. It is incredibly frustrating that countries like China are now able to do this, um, and, and therefore it, it's somewhat vexing. But the very fact that China feels like they can actually get away with this kind of hypocrisy and the fact that they can at, you know, at least have to nominally adhere to the language does matter somewhat. Furthermore, a lot of the new institutions that they've ostensibly created that are somehow supposed to represent existential threats to the Bretton Woods institutions are not, in fact, existential threats to the Bretton Woods institutions. It's very hard to describe them as that if when they create, you know, let's say the AAIB, if they create it by writing the exact same rules, norms, and procedures that exist in Bretton Woods institutions, and furthermore, hire almost all of the staff for the AAIB from sort of veteran employees of either the World Bank or the International Monetary Fund. This does not represent an existential challenge. In some ways, it goes to uh, Sarah, Sarah uh, Muller's point earlier today. It's not so much a change in the order, it's a change within the order. There is no denying that China wants to have some institutions to run on its own, but if it's running those institutions on ideas that basically are compatible with the liberal international order, then it doesn't represent an existential challenge to the liberal international order. Now, that said, Belt and Road could look different. That's the sort of example where you might point to and say, well, this is a sort of engine of kleptocracy. It's an engine in which you could see China potentially uh, uh, trying to represent a challenge to the way that the West runs the thing. Except, again, I think a lot of the debate about Belt and Road overlooks the degree to which Belt and Road has generated its own backlashes in places that have housed Belt and Road. There is a consistent correlation between China announcing a Belt and Road initiative in a country and then protests against China in that country. Um, and indeed, the protests have become so loud that China did something that many people thought was unthinkable a month ago, which is Xi Jinping admitted that they had screwed up when it came to Belt and Road. In the second Belt and Road conference, they acknowledged they had been lax with the brand. They had sort of, you know, been uh, uh, untoward in terms of everything being labeled Belt and Road. And indeed, China, in some ways, wound up being a victim of domestic politics just as the United States had been, which is a lot of sort of state-owned enterprises and development banks started branding things as BRI, thinking that by doing so, they could get them approved. Um, and it seems like they are potentially cracking down on this. So, as I said, there are, I think, three schools of thought on, on China when it comes to this sort of thing. The first is the OMG China. The second is you know, mostly by China scholars who point out the various ways in which China is screwing things up. I'm a little more of the third school, which is you always have to think about China as experimenting when it comes to actions in terms of grand strategy, which is this is a lot of trial and error. And what is disturbing to me is that China is moving down the learning curve in terms of things, initiatives like BRI. They're figuring out how to be better at doing these things, to use sort of Chinese soft power and economic power to act as an attractor for other countries. So I'm not OMG China yet, but I could get there at some point. What actually worries me at this point, however, is not just China, you know, potentially moving down the learning curve. It is in some ways China's economic weakness as well as its economic strength. The possibility of a real estate bubble popping in China, which has been long, you know, uh, long postulated still is a possibility and in some ways what I'm desperately concerned about is not what China will do if it feels strong but rather what China might do if it feels weak. Um, but that said in some ways to talk about the sort of to go back to when I uh, talked about how you would rationally revise China hasn't really engaged in a sort of rational revisionism strategy. On ideas and information they've challenged the United States or the challenged the liberal international order somewhat but not a lot. Um, in some ways, they've pushed hardest on issues of security, which are also tend to trigger the sort of greatest backlash. So 
the notion that, again, China is sort of, you know, engaging in kind of strategic genius in terms of how they're engaging in revisionism, I don't think actually speaks to actual Chinese practices, which is they're certainly trying to pursue their core interests, but if they were trying to rationally, you know, uh, act as revisionists, they're not actually doing it in the way you would expect. And in reality, the sort of structural pillars of U.S. power, particularly when it comes to security and finance, remain unchallenged. The United States still spends, you know, vastly more in terms of defense than almost every other country. It still has vastly more uh, allies than anyone else. Its military, you know, its global footprint is larger. Its command of the global economies has been weakened but far from eviscerated. And in terms of the U.S. dollar, again, all of these things are true, if not more so. Indeed, a lot of people talked about the end of the dollar as the reserve currency or the end of the U.S. as the epicenter for global capital markets after the 2008 financial crisis. In point of fact, the U.S.'s role actually strengthened after 2008. Um, and indeed, it has not gone away anytime soon. So in some ways, the most, sort of, most important components of sort of structural power the U.S. still possesses. That said, we have to turn to revisionism from within. And here I have a disturbing announcement, which is, as it turns out, the Trump administration has been really rational in terms of how it has tried to revise the liberal international order, which is the first thing it has done is attack ideas and information. Indeed, you can argue that the Trump administration and President Trump himself has been a huge fan of discrediting, you know, so-called, you know, mainstream media by decrying it as fake news, decrying statistics that he doesn't believe in as, you know, not to be trusted, you know, declaring the mainstream media to be the enemy of the people. This is a perfect way to de delegitimate the information order that we've sort of taken for granted for at least the past century. In terms of production, this is, again, something that over the last two years, the Trump administration has seemed hell-bent on disrupting global supply chains as we understand them with the idea of essentially trying to force producers to take you know, their global supply chains and move them out of China um, and, in theory, back to the United States. I think at some point they were supposed to go to Mexico, but that's not exactly working out potentially as planned. Um, on security and finance, however, they've largely been relatively quiet. And again, I, I want to echo what was said this morning, that security, there's no denying there's been a lot of rhetoric, but if you actually look at the policies, this is the one area where I do agree with Trump defenders, where you have to discriminate the rhetoric from the actions. By and large, in terms of actions, the, the security order hasn't really been affected all of that much. And in terms of finance, the Trump administration has, if anything, further weaponized um, the dollar's role in the global economy through the proliferation of sort of maximum pressure campaigns uh, and a variety of sort of secondary sanctions placed not just on adversaries but primarily on U.S. allies uh, as a way to increase pressure on Iran through, let's say, the withdrawal from the JCPOA uh, or other sort of uh, trade-based measures. The question is why. Why is the Trump administration engaging in this? And again, this is where you have to take populist nationalism seriously, and it was referred to earlier today as Jacksonianism. You know, in some ways, populism is one of those terms that, much like neoliberal or, or what have you, where it's easy to, you know, easy to sort of throw the term around without necessarily being clear about what it means. I think in some ways the best way to define populist is by what it's not, which is pluralist. Um, you know, pluralism believes that there are multiple competing interests and that eventually you have to sort of hash out a messy compromise in order to be able to actually execute policy going forward. Um, that is not what populists believe. Populists believe that a leader can divine, you know, a you know, general will from the people, and furthermore, any kind of elite that, uh, or expert that claims that they know what's best actually is not to be trusted, that these people are out of touch, and that they're usually responsible for whatever current mess creates the rise of populists in the first place. And so if you think about it in some ways, it is not surprising that populists desperately dislike the liberal international order because the liberal international order is technocratic, it's cosmopolitan, it stresses interdependence, and it is undeniably plural. And these are all things that populists despise. Populists don't like constraints on their power, they don't like experts telling them what they can't do, and they don't like alternative sources of authority. They always want to you know, consolidate authority within themselves. So as a result, populism will always strain against multilateral constraint. You know, will will strain against multilateral constraints. And again, this is entirely consistent with what Trump has done. 
So you've seen this in an array, you know, array of policies. Uh, the Trump administration has been very vigorous in exiting from an array of, of multilateral institutions and legal treaties ranging from the Trans-Pacific Partnership to the Paris Climate Change Accords to the INF Treaty to my personal favorite, the Universal Postal Union, um, because it is so obscure that not many people have heard about it. It is the oldest international organization uh, in existence, but nonetheless, uh, the Trump administration has decided that a minor beef with the UPU somehow justifies, you know, withdrawing from the whole thing. Um, and indeed, you know, uh, in some ways this is manifested not just by Trump but by John Bolton uh, in a speech in which he makes it clear that in some ways uh, the biggest threat apparently to the United States is the, uh, the International Criminal Court, I believe, which is fascinating since the United States is not a signatory to it. Um, furthermore, you've seen this in terms of the execution of a variety of trade wars against a whole, you know, again, primarily directed at allies, although China certainly counts, uh, does not count as one. And indeed, it's been articulated in a series of doctrinal speeches, most prominently by uh, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo in Brussels in December 2018. And if you read these sort of array of sort of uh, Trump speeches like this, including Trump and Bolton and Pompeo, there is no way to conclude otherwise than the fact the, you know, a significant existential threat to the United States is the European Union. The European Union apparently represents everything uh, that Jacksonians can't stand, which is it's multilateral, uh, it articulates liberal principles, and it encourages an erosion of sovereignty, which is the one thing that Jacksonians or populists do not like. And so I agree with the, the previous speaker who said that, that uh, Populists are not isolationists. Trump is certainly not an isolationist. He's a unilateralist. He wants to be able to do whatever he can do uh, without any kind of constraints whatsoever. So how did this happen? How did we get here? How did we get from a situation where in 2014 you could still point out to the ways in which the liberal international order was contributing to the solution to now it being somehow blamed as being the source of all the problems? And in the United States, at least, there are three sort of trends that you have to look at to see how we got here. The first is, and you know, it's worth pointing out that all three of these trends predate President Trump's election. Uh, the first trend is the erosion of trust and authority and expertise. Um, if you take a look at survey data in the United States, whether it's Gallup, whether it's the General Social Survey, uh, whether it's Pew, what have you, they all show the same thing, which is there was a peak of trust uh, in institutions, both governmental and non-governmental, beginning uh, in the mid-1960s. Watergate in Vietnam caused a significant dent to it. It fluctuated significantly over the next couple of decades. It peaked again after the September 11th terrorist attacks, and it has nosedived ever since then. Um, and, you know, again, from the, the quote from the Edelman Trust Barometer demonstrates this. Uh, as a result of this, it's not just a distrust in the federal government or what the government says. It's also a distrust more broadly in experts in general. Because experts, including in the foreign policy community, are viewed as the people in the United States responsible for the Iraq War, for the forever war in Afghanistan, for Syria, for Libya, oh, and by the way, for the 2008 financial crisis. And so it becomes very difficult for anyone to argue from authority because it can be you know, claimed, well, what do you know? The second trend, and this one you're probably familiar with, is the rise of political polarization. Um, essentially, survey data and experimental data, you know, demonstrates significantly now that partisan elites in both, you know, on both sides now um, are more likely to discriminate based on political affiliation than on race or gender or sexual orientation. Indeed, partisan elites now in, in the United States don't want their children to marry outside of their political persuasion. It is in some ways replaced religion as the most important source of identity. Um, now, part of this is due to, to potentially what is called partisan sorting, which is it used to be that, let's say, Southern Democrats were actually more conservative than, let's say, Northeastern Republicans. So it's not necessarily that individuals have gotten more uh, ideologically extreme. They've just sorted into the correct parties. But partisan sorting nonetheless creates these stronger sense of identities, which means they're not willing to acknowledge that the other side might have any kind of a point whatsoever. And this becomes um, particularly difficult if you're going to talk about foreign policy. Because in any kind of, of you know, foreign policy or grand strategy formulation, the moment that an issue gets politically polarized, it becomes next to impossible to generate any kind of bri uh, broad consensus. Essentially, anyone who articulates this gets branded as either an out-of-touch you know, coastal elite or an uninformed you know, Midwestern uh, uh, proto-fascist. And so as a result, there can be no conversation on this kind of thing. And furthermore, 
This polarization winds up eroding two things that used to be, you know, important contributions to the articulation of U.S. grand strategy. The first being the sort of marketplace of ideas as we commonly understand it, and the second being Congress. Essentially, Congress, as it became more and more polarized, became less able to actually effectively legislate and effectively play a constructive role in the articulation of U.S. foreign policy. And indeed, this leads to the last trend, which was essentially the ebbing of executive constraints. You know, the U.S. Constitution was designed so that, in fact, while the president had significant foreign policy power, it had far from a monopoly on it. Um, you know, Congress was originally authorized as being the actor, being the branch of government responsible for both the declaration of war and the setting of trade policy. Um, but in point of fact, as polarization has proceeded, essentially, Congress has voluntarily ceded more and more authority to the president because they recognized that they themselves could not necessarily govern. Um, and indeed, even things like oversight hearings have declined dramatically uh, over the last 30 to 40 years because there's not that much incentive for Congress to pay attention because most Americans, and unfortunately, do not care about foreign policy. And similarly, you've seen this in the judiciary in which increasingly, particularly in the post-9-11 period, the courts have shown remarkable deference to the executive branch when it comes to anything that is given a national security label. Um, to the point where essentially they will very rarely act as a constraint as well. As a result, we are now operating in a world in which grand strategy and foreign policy in the United States is, may, is almost the exclusive preserve of the President of the United States and the executive branch, which is a problem because unless they can get some buy-in from Congress, Essentially, you wind up with a situation in which a president will articulate a grand strategy, and that grand strategy cannot last more than four to eight years. And the reason is, is that for this to happen, for any grand strategy to endure, you have to make sure your successors are willing to you know, honor the bargains that you've implemented. But as Congress has refused to play a larger role, essentially almost all of foreign policy is done through executive action alone. When President Trump withdrew from the Paris Climate Change Accords, and when he withdrew from the JCPOA, and when he reversed the Cuba opening that the Obama administration did, you can argue whether those views were the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do. They were entirely legal. Because when Obama did these things, he did the, all three of these things with almost, in, almost no congressional input whatsoever. And so as a result, they're very easy to be reversed. So can this problem be reversed? Um, well, I have two pieces, I have one piece of good news and one piece of bad news. The good news is that in terms of the ideas that animate the liberal international order, which you can think of as sort of an open global economy, um, the idea of, you know, a larger U.S. footprint and you sort of U.S. working with allies, um, the public opinion has not actually moved with Donald Trump. It's actually moved away from Donald Trump. It turns out that populist nationalism is not actually all that popular. Um, if you take a look at, and this data is uh, from Gallup, uh, if anything, what is striking about this is the degree to which, you know, by and large, you know, attitudes about immigrants, for example, are at their highest and most positive point uh, at any time in the last uh, 20 years. Similarly, if you take a look at U.S. attitudes about free trade, for all the talk about sort of some sort of backlash to globalization, a backlash to uh, uh, neoliberal economics, if anything, Americans have become more enthusiastic about free trade uh, during the era of Donald Trump. And indeed, even sort of the, you know, stand-in question for multilateralism about working through the United Nations, this is from the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, um, Americans have become actually more enthusiastic about working multilaterally, not less enthusiastic. And the same is true if I had shown you attitudes from the Chicago Council on basing troops overseas. All the sort of hot-button issues that Trump insists resonate deeply within the United States, it turns out resonate not at all outside of his core uh, constituency. So that's the good news. The bad news is the following. The first of all is that while the public might be rejecting uh, Trump's argument at the liberal international order, they also primarily don't care. These are not issues on which Americans will vote. The 2020 election will not be decided on questions of grand strategy and foreign policy. And indeed, when you ask Americans what the liberal international order means in focus groups, they have no freaking clue what it means. To be fair, part of that is because, as I said, you know, in some ways, we all have not necessarily you know, defined it as, as well as we could, but it also is the fact that essentially Americans, when it comes to this subject, are rationally ignorant. Which is, and by rational ignorance, I mean it is not worth their while to necessarily care all that much about this because they can't necessarily connect these larger issues to their pocketbook 
to their daily lives. And so as a result, they're not going to vote based on this. The second problem is that essentially you have to combine the fact that the president sort of now has the monopoly on foreign policy with the increased polarization of both political parties. George w, in this century, George W. Bush was the most conservative Republican to serve in office. Barack Obama was then the most liberal Democrat to serve in office. And at least in terms of his policies, Donald Trump was far more conservative than George W. Bush. Extrapolate that out further. Imagine a foreign policy of Donald Trump replaced by a foreign policy of Bernie Sanders. And then advantage Bernie Sanders being replaced by Senator Tom Cotton. And then imagine Senator Tom Cotton being replaced by Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Essentially, you would have a foreign policy that would be bipolar. And I don't mean that in the realpolitik way. I mean that in the psychological way. Okay. Um, in the United States, there's a, a policy that is often called the Mexico City policy. Uh, this refers to the way in which um, the executive branch deals with family planning in terms of funding family planning agencies, whether or not they uh, contribute to um, or will fund abortions. So basically the general rule, and this has been true since the Reagan administration, is that if a Republican is elected president, um, the federal government stops funding any kind of planning agency that will you know, help to fund abortions. If a Democrat is elected president, they reverse that. What I am suggesting is that going forward, it almost doesn't matter what grand strategy the U.S. president articulates because that U.S. grand strategy will be wiped out in the next 48 years. Essentially, all of U.S. foreign policy will resemble the Mexico City policy. It will get constantly changed, you know, as a Democrat is replaced by a Republican and then by a Democrat again. So in conclusion, the liberal international order is not dead, but it's not exactly in great shape. The problem is not Russia, it's not China, it's the United States. And domestic political changes will make U.S. maintenance of the liberal international order, despite the fact that the U.S. still possesses significant reservoirs of power, phenomenally difficult. Because unless the president is able to do what presidents never want to do, which is actually cede power to Congress, they will never be able to credibly commit again. And this is going to be a problem going forward. And on that cheery note, thank you very much.